Okay, what's the magic word today here on a Wednesday? Here on Hawaii, the state of clean energy, what's the magic word? It's Lani Shinsato. That's two words. <laughs> Lani, for sure. <laughs> Hi, Lani. Hi, Jay. <laughs> And that's Mitch Ewan. Well, it's the second magic word. Aloha, y'all. Back from the back from the wars in Long Beach. We'll yeah, talk about that. Exactly. So, Lonnie, I, I guess congratulations are in order. Talk about the changes you're involved in Hawaiian Electric. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, thank you for having me. Um, we're under some exciting changes right now. We've um, merged with another department, and we've rebranded, and we've also done sort of a one company change. Um, so, all of our uh, Tri company folks who work on rooftop solar and batteries, uh, what we call um, customer energy resources. Used well, to be distributed. Used to be distributed energy resources, now customer energy resources, our new name. We're all under a unified team and vision and leadership. Yeah, the, the message I get is the magic word is really customer. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's a big part of why we did it. Uh, yeah. We wanted to make things more simple for our customers um, and have a more customer-friendly name. Yeah. Um, distributed energy resources was sort of falling flat. I never knew what the, it meant anyway. The normal person, did you know, like Mitch, my mom? what it meant? What is distributed? Yeah, energy? I did. It's a very yeah, technical, did. you know, thing. <laughs> distributed energy customer, energy I know what that means. But it's yeah. kind of You're in the industry, it's techie, so, yeah, right. Yeah, it's too techie, <laughs> yeah. right? And uh, we merged with demand response, which had a similar problem. No one really knew what that meant. Sounds very... You know, interesting, sexy. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> Who's demanding what? Who's responding in what way? Right. <laughs> it's, it's provocative. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know provocative, but yeah. yeah. Good. So now it's all in one place. All in one place. And you're running it, but you have a partnership going, no? Yes. Um, so my uh, co-partner in crime now, Yo Kawanami, uh, we would have loved to have been here today, both of us, but he's under the weather, so we'll have to come next time and, and talk more together as a team about uh, what we plan to do with our new team. Okay. Shout out for Yo. 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 <laughs> yo. <Yay. laughs> Aloha, Yo. Come on down, Yo. <laughs> yes, yes. We will bring him down for sure. So what does it mean, though? I mean, uh, tell me what it means conceptually before. Maybe it's close to the same now, but uh, mm -hmm. the nomenclature is different. What does it mean? Where does it fit, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of the company, um, you know, the the... The, the, the fulfillment of the company's mission, the engagement between the company and, and the customer? Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you, great question. Um, I don't know if many people know this, but customer energy resources are a huge part of our future. Um, so you both know that we have the 100% RPS goal by 2045. Sure. Actually, I have that uh, tattooed on the inside of my eyeball. <laughs> I feel like I have the same tattoo. <laughs> um, but our customer energy resources are going to make up a huge part of that resource mix. So we need to figure out how to expand what we already have now to that huge scale that we need in the future. And you know, too, that we already have a lot now. We're leading the nation. Um, so it's kind of daunting for us to think, okay, we have to do even more. Um, but that's a part of our plan. And so um, having that in our minds, we wanted to have this very customer-centric um, team to do that and name so that we can go out and start to market more of our, our programs and make sure that we're able to get that kind of continued adoption of customer resources going forward. Yeah, these are exciting times, aren't they? In the sense that we have been sort of around the issue, around clean energy for almost 20 years. Uh, you were 20 years younger then, by the way. I was. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, now we're getting closer to, you know, 2045 or 2040, as the case mm -hmm. may be. And wow. it's right out there. Mm -hmm. And somebody's got to be thinking about it 24 right. by 7. Yes. Somebody's got to be bringing it to fruition. And I, what I get is that you are critical in that, in that part of it. You have to find a way, find a path, find the momentum, find the vitality, whatever it is, you know, the, the mission-oriented thinking. Take us there. That's absolutely right. How do you right. sleep at night? It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's absolutely right, Jay. I think, you know, we've done a lot, right? And we're getting a lot of recognition for having done a lot. Um, but our team had to sort of um, press pause and take a step back and, and say, you know, we've got to innovate even more and figure out the strategy going forward for how we're going to get more. And 
um, do it in a way, and it's not an easy thing to do. You can't just interconnect everybody um, all at once. You know, we have to think about, you know, making it safe for the grid and making it still affordable for all of our customers. Some may not want to do customer resources like, you know, PV or batteries, and we have to think about them too. So it has to be fair and sustainable um, over time. Well, you're carving, you're carving it out of whole cloth in the sense that we are involved in a great experiment out here, mm -hmm. and you're really at the point of that. But, but Mitch has a question. I have yes. a couple of questions. So, like, how are you going to make it easier for the customer? Things that come to mind are permitting, financing, mm -hmm. Uh, approvals by the utility company, you know, uh, not having to do these very expensive engineering studies. Mm -hmm. Is that all on the list of things to make this uh, easier for the customer to go to a PV or a wind turbine or whatever he's going to have? For sure, all of those things. And we've made some progress in those areas. Um, you know, in our past, when we had a lot of solar coming on all at once, we had to kind of stop and do some studies and figure out how to do some traditional upgrades to the infrastructure in order right. to accommodate the solar. Um, thankfully, we've sort of moved past that. We've um, started to use advanced inverters more and um, advanced metering that helps us you know, not have to do all that stuff that slows sure. it down. So we want to continue using technology um, mm -hmm. to streamline the process and be able to accommodate more and more um, customer resources going forward. Um, another thing we want to do is right now we have a lot of different options for our customers. And in a way that's good, but what we're hearing from some of our stakeholders, our customers, our solar industry is that it's sort of overly complicated at times yeah. because we've got too much. So we want to be able to simplify offerings for our customers and sort of narrow them down. Um, and take out kind of all the technology and the stuff that our customers probably don't care about um, and have it be very customer friendly, um, a, a sort of a simple menu of options. So these are the things that we're kind of thinking through right now. So one other question, uh, what about the interface with the PV companies themselves? They probably carried a lot of this stuff with them when they went to a customer and made it easier for the customer. How are you gonna interface with the uh, PV industry? We absolutely need to be partners in this future, uh, right? Because they're, they're a huge part of it. And we can't afford to have sort of start stops, these right. famines, you know, yeah, in the right. market, right? If we need to hit the 2045 scale of customer resources that we need, uh, we have to make sure we're doing this in collaboration with the, our solar industry. And so we try to meet pretty regularly with them and build mm -hmm. healthy relationships and, and get their feedback. What kind of feedback are you getting from them initially? Mm -hmm. I know it's early times, but mm -hmm. do you have a feel um, for it yet? Some of what we've been hearing is that we want to have a clear path forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with them, um, so we're trying to create that. They want some stability. Um, they want to make sure, for our local contractors, they want to make sure that they're a part of the picture and it's not going to be just, you know, kind of big uh industry solar industry type of players um playing here in the state and and we absolutely want to see a place for all of our local guys to do so right. making yeah, making industry, space for everybody yeah they gotta they gotta eat too that's right and as a matter of fact i saw a piece the other day where they were 67 percent up this i'm talking about the installers mm, the yeah. solar installers mm. so they're doing okay mm, that's uh, as good. opposed to earlier years when they were trending down right uh, Anyway, Lonnie, um, our time is up. It, uh, uh, parting is such sweet sorrow. Um, we're going to go to a break, and then we're going to talk to uh, Mitch and find out what he's been doing with his spare time. Right. Sounds fun. And hydrogen, the like. Thank you so much for coming Thank down. Thank you very much for having me. And you want to see the power of our electronics? Watch this. <laughs> Aloha. My name is Victoria, and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners, where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners. Uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Um, see you soon. Mahalo. Hey, aloha, everyone, and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Matters Hawaii. We air here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, trying to bring you issues about security that you may not know, issues that can protect your family, 
protect yourself, protect our community, protect our, our companies, the folks we work with. Uh, please join us and I uh, hope you can um, maybe get a little different perspective on how to live a little safer. Aloha. I told you we would return, and uh, Lonnie's gone. Oh, okay. But Mitch is still here. Right. And he's going to talk about his trip to uh, uh, Long Beach, just came back, where they talked about fuel cells. And uh, the question is whether you learned from them or they learned from you, Mitch. Well, I think it was a little bit of both. The uh, show was really well attended. The uh, kind of the mood was up. The uh, hydrogen industry is uh, rejuvenated. Uh, Fuel cell energy got an investment of $230 mil, uh, $200 million, and then uh, from one venture capitalist or a funding organization, and then Exxon has put in an additional 60 into fuel cell energy. So that rose everybody's spirits. There was all sorts of really new gear, and uh, we got updated on the latest state of the art. But I, I made a presentation there on Hawaii, the state of hydrogen. And I say that That's because... Great. So we have this show called Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Exactly. Now it's uh, Hawaii, the state of hydrogen. Well, they're <laughs> kind that. of both the same thing, really. Of course. It's of the course, same thing. Yeah. So why don't you throw up that first slide? I want to sh show off my... See, now, what a beautiful logo that is. H2YE, so it's Hawaii, the state, of, yeah. uh, the state of hydrogen. And we really are. So let's uh, look at the next slide. So really, it's the law. And uh, the reason I say that is like about 12, 13 years ago, we actually passed a law on the books. You can see it, Hawaii Revised Statute 196-10. It really said that Hawaii has to transition over to a hydrogen economy. Now, when that, they didn't say how soon that was going to happen, but it's, it's on the books. I'm not sure there's any other state in the United States that has that mandate, and that's policy. And that, that's, I think it was Calvin Say who sponsored that. He was Speaker of the House at the time. Of course. And uh, did this a great job. This was the same uh, statute that created the hydrogen fund, wasn't it? Absolutely. And uh, it was very uh, forward thinking. And uh, he actually funded it with originally $10 million. And uh, that was meant to bring in big contracts, like from the U.S. Department of Energy, like multi-million dollar contracts where there's a requirement to have cost share. And before that, we were doing kind of small projects so we could like take the cost share out of our hide and, and do some you know, innovative financing, but you know, write off people's time or, or downsize it. But when you get into multi-million dollar contracts, you need a multi-million dollar cost share to leverage that. So you get about a four to one or a five to one uh, benefit for every dollar that you put in, the feds would put in four to five dollars. I think we've used it pretty well. Several of my projects have uh, leveraged that fund. Well, for example, on the Big Island, uh, my project at Nelha, most of that infrastructure was paid for uh, out of the, the hydrogen fund. So can we have another slide, please. Next slide. So uh, this past slide, I mean, I've talked about 12 years ago, but just this year, this last legislative session, we passed two really important uh, pieces of legislation. One is we finally got hydrogen electric vehicles classified as an electric vehicle. Same status as a battery electric vehicle, and we get the same benefits. And you can see some of them there, like using the, the uh, high occupancy lane, we get you know, parking and et cetera, et cetera, which we didn't have before. It took us six years, believe it or not, to get that through, around six years to get that through the legislature. Too bad it took so long. Yeah, but we, we, we got it. And I'd I like to uh, shout out to uh, Senator uh, Lorraine anyway, who actually sponsored it and got it through. So um, if you want to throw that slide back up again, the same slide. Nope, back a slide. Okay, the second bill was House Bill 401. Now this is transformative. What it did is it established uh, what we call transportation services contracts. That was the brainchild of Riley Sato, who's the deputy uh, at the, uh, on the Big Island, the, the uh, County of Hawaii R&D Department. And what it essentially does is just like an energy savings performance contract, it allows the counties to go out to private industry and fund their transportation. So for example, 
Big Island. I would like to see a fleet of 50 to 60 hydrogen buses, or they could. Some of them could be battery electric buses. Knock wood. It yeah. should happen soon. But the but the way we do it is like uh, every year we may buy three or four buses, so it, can, it could take 20 years or 15 years before we get that fleet in. With this program, you can go out with an RFP to industry and say, look, you guys supply the buses. You supply all the infrastructure, i.e., where you're going to get your hydrogen from or where you're going to get electricity from, charging stations, uh, and maintenance. And we will pay you a services fee based on some metric, like, for example, passenger miles traveled. And so that allows us to make a leapfrog to really convert our vehicle fleets a lot faster. I'm just using an example of buses, but the county has all sorts of vehicles, dump trucks, uh, you know, uh, tractor trailer trucks, they can convert their whole fleet over. And so this allows us, as I said, to make this big leap really fast and will allow us to meet some of our energy goals and transform us faster to a hydrogen economy. In my case, that's one of my pet projects. How does this dovetail with um, you know, what uh, Lonnie was saying? What's the connection, if, if there is one? I've got to absorb it a little, but basically hydrogen is an energy storage uh, technology. So it could compete against batteries. She talked about batteries and rooftop solar. It's part of, the, it's yeah. part of her department, her program. Yeah, right? part of the energy mix. So you know, we're looking at uh, hydrogen for energy storage. For example, uh, if you have excess uh, Wind, for example, is being curtailed. We can use it to make hydrogen and store it for long periods of time. And, and the data shows that it's more economic at large scale, at what we call at scale, to store energy like gigawatt hours of energy um, for long-term storage. Whereas if you're just storing it for a night or you know one or two days, a battery is perfectly satisfactory. Well, it's, it's true, but you know, my, at, at my the battery, home my phone, all my batteries, they yeah. degrade at roughly a percent every day. Sure. Uh, something like that. And, uh, and so hydrogen doesn't degrade that way. It doesn't degrade. Yeah. It, uh, you, know, you can store it in a, in a gas bottle and it can last for 10 years or longer as long as you are, your valves don't leak, but they don't yeah. usually leak. So yeah, it's still there. It doesn't degrade. Uh, sunlight doesn't cause it to grow algae in it like diesel fuel does. I mean, diesel fuel, you have to, every three months, basically have to, you should be filtering it. And that's, people don't. They just let that diesel engine sit there as a backup that, generator, and then when you really need that it. That degrades too. It doesn't work. Like yeah. uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, in, the, uh, you know, in New York and New Jersey, that's what they found. They had all their, all their diesel generators failed. The only things just sitting there for years. Yeah, the only things that worked, they had about 25 fuel cell, stationary fuel cell systems that worked. And uh, that's what kept, uh, kept the communications going, all the critical loads. So same, same kind of a, uh, a, um, a concept here. What about, uh, what about the technology on fuel cells? I mean, <laughs> fuel cells, as you said, <clears throat> are highly efficient. Right. Uh, it's, it's great technology. But um, you know, somewhere in this progression, there will be uh, technological advances to fuel cells. And I wonder if that was something that was discussed at the conference. Absolutely. They had several speakers talking about the um, technological pro uh, progress, like they're getting more, um, uh, more hours on them. For example, there's some fuel cells on buses in, uh, at AC Transit that have operated for over 32,000 hours without failure and uh, that that's something that's something and they're still going and of course the other part of it is the prices are coming down i wouldn't say they're exponentially going down but slow and steady progress on on reducing costs designing it better the big one of the big costs is what they call balance the systems all the pumps and the valves and the you know the electronics are all getting better more robust as we go along. Well, HNEI is doing research on fuel cells. What's the cutting edge? What, what, are, what are the points of research these days? What problems are people trying to solve? If you could discuss it. Well, I think the big problem right now that people want to solve is just to get the cost of them down. I think we've pretty well solved the uh, durability and, and uh, you know, 32,000 hours is a lot of hours. So, like, how much more are you going to make there? The other parts you're trying to solve is where do we get the hydrogen from? So, for example, um, 
based on a huge order of, uh, for electrolyzers from Nikolai Motors, um, once the electrolyzer manufacturer who got the contract uh, starts producing them, the cost of that electrolyzer will go down 40% is what they're predicting. That's huge. That's a big thing. Yeah, because... That brings it within the grasp of the ordinary person. Right. Technologically, the improving the efficiency, you only get like incremental. It's very slow. You can't, there's no dramatic leap in efficiency. But now you got the cost down. That's, that's very significant. So mm -hmm. it reduces your capital expenses. Speaking and of, of course, cost, you know, yeah, I was talking to my walking partner this morning, <laughs> and we were talking about the uh, relative cost of um, a, a, a fossil fuel car. Uh, okay. Okay, versus and why people, you know, liked them or didn't like them, and an electric car. And we concluded that the difference, you know, is largely in the cost of replacing the battery. You know, I think we got yeah. by the range anxiety thing already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now people are worried that, you know, a few years down the road, are they going to call up AAA? <laughs> yeah, right. And AAA is going to come, come out and charge them $3,000 for a new battery. Or more. So, or more. So yeah. my question to you is, does a similar, you know, problem, uh, a similar, you know, issue exist with regard to fuel cell cars, hydrogen cars? Um, I don't think so. Um, you know, the, basically, like I said, the fuel cell stack or the, the, the thing that generates the power will last forever. Your tank is going to last, your hydrogen tank is going to last forever. So there's not those kinds of things. I mean, really what they want to do is get the cost of the hydrogen down. That's the significant thing. And uh, the cost of the hydrogen is directly related to the input energy you have to put into your system to make it. So that's why if you can get really inexpensive solar or curtailed wind or the best, in my opinion, geothermal power, which operates 24 seven, um, that will get the cost of the hydrogen down to where it's totally competitive, if not better than fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And fossil fuels aren't gonna stay cheap forever. I mean, we're, we're enjoying this, this lull, as Richard Ha has said, you know, with, uh, with all the, all the uh, gas that they're getting, the, the natural gas. But, He's projecting that's going to start going up in the next, you know, couple of years. So, you know, we've, we've got to be moving fast so well, we don't get caught. <clears throat> we've discussed this before, and I've discussed this with Richard Ha a couple of times, uh, is the Big Island is kind of like the main laboratory. It's HNI, HNEI and the Big Island and, and PGV, PGV. And right. so the question I, I'm interested in is uh, how important is the restoration of service at PGV to all the projects you have in mind on the Big Island? Uh, it's pretty critical. Uh, we, can, we can do it with other uh, resources, but like, as I said, the best resource is, is the geothermal plant because your equipment's operating 24 hours a day, whereas if I have a solar array, you may get five hours of sun, and then you got all this heavy, all this expensive equipment sitting around waiting for the next day. And mm -hmm. you know, what if you have a storm? You know? so, that's the issue. And same with wind, it's only like the best wind resources are about 40% of the time you have them. Whereas what you really want is, you know, 24-7. Yeah. The other one is hydro. I mean, there are some hydro resources on the Big Island. The, uh, the Wailuku River, northeast of Hilo. Well, that, and there's some down in Ka'u. They're, they're looking at the old... Uh, the old uh, irrigation ditches over there have been, have been reclaimed by, uh, by you know, um, some people. And uh, that's, that's a resource that's... So you go, you go to Long Beach and yep. you talk about hydrogen, you talk about fuel cells, you talk about generating hydrogen, which is a critical <laughs> part of the whole, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, of the whole examination. Uh, how do the people on the mainland get their hydrogen? They don't have PGV, they don't have geothermal. Uh, many places, they don't have the hydro either. Uh, how are they getting it? Well, right now they get it from natural gas. They reform, what, break down natural gas, carve off the carbon by combining it with oxygen, and then they vent off all this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. They're still getting a benefit because it's, the overall process is still more efficient than a gasoline engine, for example. And so they're saying that you get a, re not necessarily more efficient, but you get a reduction and the amount of carbon that you're emitting, about a 30% reduction if you're using that process, even with a fuel cell. 
So, and when you're looking at an electric car, for example, people look at the electric car and they say, because I'm plugging into the wall, that electricity must be like clean, but it's not. It depends on how you how you got how it. You, yeah. How you got it. Yeah. So, you know, if you have a high uh, a high uh, percentage of fossil fuels or whatever, or, or whatever, I mean, you, most of them are using natural gas on the main line to uh, on the mainland to generate electricity. Um, I have a thought for you, the, Rich. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, seems to me that um, when you're storing hydrogen, right. putting it in that tank for future use, yeah. you're not really sure when you're going to use it. It could be days, weeks, months, right. even longer. Yeah. Um, it's not critical that you that you generate it on a rapid basis. You can generate it slowly. It's yeah, exactly. okay to generate it slowly. So maybe in the future, just a thought here, in the future, um, the technology that would create and store the hydrogen in the tank for future use, that te technology could be slow. And maybe yeah. as, because slow technology could be cheaper somehow, um, and, and it could be like a trickle charge, just a little, a little every hour, a little every day. Well, Before you know it, you've filled up the tank, and hopefully you've done it in a technology with a technology that is cheaper than anything we can think of today. Yeah, we're uh, talking to uh, you know, the Marine Corps base, for example. Uh, resilience is a very important thing with the military now. They want 14 days of uh, critical load. And yeah, I mean, the grid is very pretty stable. It doesn't go down every day. So you could build up that 14-day supply over several years until you actually need it when all of a sudden something happens and you lose all your power to the base. Yeah, yeah. Then you pile into your... Um, your uh, hydrogen supply, so you don't have to have a monster, you know, electrolyzer churning out, you know, thousands of kilograms of hydrogen a day. It's like you say, you can take little slices here, little slices there, keep loads even. So, like when and look at time of use, for example, if the grid's uh, you know, got very expensive power at the end yeah, of the day, yeah. you don't you don't yeah. use it then. Yeah. You wait you wait till it's cheap, yeah. and expensive. Well, it must have been a great conversation because you know. Um, to put a whole bunch of experts about hydrogen in one room like that, or how many rooms it was. Oh, there were several it, rooms. It's pretty <laughs> exciting. Yeah. And that bringing from various walks of life, various you know, backgrounds, various companies, that must have been a real thrill for you. And I'm, and I'm wondering you know, what it was like in terms of running into soulmates, hydrogen soulmates. <laughs> Did you meet people you didn't know? Did you meet people who wanted to come to Hawaii and see what you were doing? Did you meet people that were you know, brothers in hydrogen over time? All of the above, like <laughs> met all kinds of them. I'm already getting some follow-on emails from people I hadn't met before who want to know more about what we're doing here in Hawaii and you know, what kind of opportunities might be there for them and their technology. Plus guys I've known for 30 years, you know, in the business, it was like old home week, it was yeah. great. Yeah, P.S., um, you know, collaboration always helps. And yes, it does. Collaborators, there's a real benefit in that. Yeah, you revisit what people are doing. Like, for example, a U.S. Hybrid, who is here in Hawaii. They have a small operation here, and they're supplying my fuel cells for my buses. They were there with a couple of their brand-new uh, uh, fuel cells on display. And their president, Abbas Ghadarzi, uh, gave us all a big rundown. And, you know, I brought people from UH and other people there to see him. And so he could brief them up on the latest, uh, his latest state-of-the-art, which is very good, I might say. We're really lucky to have them here in Hawaii. So, yes, but yes, it's a, it's a it's a way to trade ideas. What are you doing? Oh, I didn't know you were doing that. Oh, that's interesting. I, how can I leverage that and use it for Hawaii? Yeah, that's that's what it's all about. You've have, you've been working on hydrogen for as long as I know you, right. and um, and uh, it seems to me that there's more momentum going on uh, in hydrogen and around you and HNEI and. And, right. and the Big Island than there ever was. Am I right about that? Ah, oh, you're right about that. You had a show yesterday with uh, Tim Richards, council member Tim Richards on the Big Island and Stan the Energy Man, and Stan Osserman. And yeah, we're getting pretty close to uh, deploying those first buses. Just going through the final commissioning issues, to make sure everything's like 100%. Failure is not an option. So we want this thing to be really smooth and roll out well. Our bus is already ready to go. It's just sitting here in Oahu. So we give them the green light to ship it over, and then we can start operating it. Once we actually start operating the bus, 
that's going to be a key milestone because then people will get a chance to ride on it, see the advantages of it, and it won't be vaporware. It'll be well, real. We have to cover it. Yeah. We have to cover it because you know, the, the world should know, and there's all kinds of benefits in having the world know. Yeah, we should do. We should set up a, a movie uh, set over there, and when we roll it out, we you know, make a nice video <laughs> for Think Tech Hawaii. That'd it's all great. set, Mitch. Okay. Mitch Ewan. Thank you. Thank you so Jay, much. Energy, yeah. hydrogen, all the same. Yeah. Clean, man. Yeah. <laughs> Clean and mean. <laughs>